All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Thank you. So, all right. So here's the plan today. Okay. So at this point, we have talked about. So we we are talking about the chemical reactions. Okay. And the and we are using a model to explain the chemical reactions. That model says that we have a box. We have reactants in that box. They move around constantly, and when they collide, they the atoms are rearranged to form new substances called products. Okay. So uh, and then this is this model is based on six assumptions so far. We have talked about assumption one, and based on that, we balanced equations. We did stoichiometric calculations. And right now, you should be able to complete Unit 4, Module 2 as well. Okay, Module 2, Unit 4, Module 2 homework as well. Okay, so what I did was I posted the second video um, related to Unit 4 on your D12 site that goes over seven of the, yeah, seven questions from Unit 4, Module 2. This is like almost 70% of the questions of Unit 4, Module 2. Okay, so my recommendation is you first you try yourself without looking at the explanations if you get stuck only then you know refer to the video so that you can get an explanation on how to you know go about solving the problem okay that's my recommendation and also there are three homework assignments due uh that th th this coming sunday but i really recommend that you complete them complete at least one attempt of each of them is it three or two maybe two and uh, anyway complete the homework assignments before the exam for which is this friday okay if you don't do it you're going to be at a big disadvantage because you wouldn't have seen you wouldn't have gotten all the practice that you shouldn't have gotten i mean you know, by by doing them so please at least at least do one attempt of those uh, homework assignments okay second attempt you can do later if you want to all right do we have any questions concerns comments by the way we have exam for this friday like i mentioned the okay, same place as before uh, same time as well, 5, 5 p.m. And then week from this Friday, we're going to have our final exam when we're done. Okay. This is going to be our second last Tuesday of the semester. Just, yeah, just a reminder. The winter is coming. All right. Do we have any questions, concerns, comments at the moment? Anything? Anything? Okay. All right. If that is the case, here's a question on the screen. The idea, so there are two objectives of this one. Number one, to remind us about what we have done before, like using the submicrobic representation to come up with the balanced chemical reaction. I will test you on that during the exam. You should be able to do that, okay? And number two, to show, so give you an idea about what, we, what we'll be learning today, that is energy diagrams, okay? By the end of today, we should be able to tackle energy diagrams as shown on the, on the screen. All right, go ahead. I'll give you one more minute in your groups. All right, let's see how we did on this. Here we go. All right, here are our responses. Okay, limiting reactant, energy diagram. Uh, the most popular answer is C. Okay, okay. Anyway, but you can see the number here is 52. The others are like very high. That means we have confidence in questions one and two, but three, yeah, we will have by the end of today. Okay, that's going to be the goal. All right. Now, um, let me see. I'm thinking, should I do the first two parts? Oh. All right, you know what? Let me do the first two parts. It's okay. I mean, you, sh you will make notes anyway, so I'm going to do that. Okay. So first thing is to, balance, to, have, to write the balanced chemical reaction. What we have is P4. Okay, so because these are P atoms or phosphorus atoms, okay, reacting with hydrogen, okay, to produce PH3, this is P again, it's P as well, okay, PH3, that's it. Okay, I'm not going to write this because this is an excess reactant, excess. Okay. And then we have four phosphorus atoms on the reactant side. We only have one, so I'm going to multiply this by four. So I have phosphorus balanced. And then hydrogen, I have two on the reactant side, but 12 on the product side. So I'm going to multiply this by six. 
Okay. Therefore, I see that the stoichiometric coefficient of hydrogen is six. Okay. That's the that's why you selected six as the answer. And the limiting reactant, we have phosphorus in excess. We run out of hydrogen first. Therefore, hydrogen must be the limiting reactant. This must be our limiting reactant. Any questions, concerns, comments about this? Anything? All right, energy diagrams, I'm going to come back to. I'm going to come back to the energy diagram in a second, okay? Uh, that means I'm going to reopen this as well, so it's fine. But do we have anything before we move on? I mean, you're not moving on. Going back to my first slide I want to talk about. All right, let's do this then. Let me clear my doodling. Okay, here we go. Here's another question for you. Let's think about a chemical reaction, okay? In a chemical reaction, we start with reactants. And then the reactant, when the reactants collide, these atoms are rearranged to form new substances called products. Okay. Now we know that much. So if that is the case, tell me, during a chemical reaction, where do we have bond breaking and where do we have bond forming? Go ahead. All right. I think we have close to 80% answers now. More than 80%. All right, I have more than 90% answers. So I'm going to close this question in five, four, three, two, and one. And here are our responses. Okay, that's beautiful. Okay, most of us said bonds are broken in the reactants and bonds are formed in the products. Okay, one more time. Okay, so we start with initial substances called reactants. Okay. For them to give us new substances called products, those bonds in the reactants must break. Okay? If they don't break, how can they rearrange, right? So they need to break in the reactants and then on the product side, they need to form. So bonds are broken on the reactant side while bonds are formed on the product side. Do we have any questions about that? Any, anything? No, okay. Anything, any questions, concerns, comments? No. Okay. Now... I feel like I want to mention one other thing here, but maybe not. Maybe a little bit later. I'll, I'll do that. So, to give me, let me ask you. To break bonds, do we need to provide energy or will the energy be released? To break bonds? Oh, let's take a vote. Okay. So, I mean, we, we can forget about this as well in, in, in about 30 seconds, but that's okay. Now, one more time. All right. When we break bonds, will the energy be released or energy be absorbed? Who says energy will be absorbed during bond breaking? Who says energy will be released during bond breaking? My goodness, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Okay. Um... I, I know where this is coming from, but that is not that is that is not correct. Okay, uh, but it's okay. We'll we'll talk about this later. All right. Anyway, so let's do let's do this. All right, and here are our responses. Okay, the most popular answer is this. Okay, stronger bonds means lower potential energy and weaker bonds means higher potential energy. Then that is correct. Okay, again, one more time. Stronger bonds means we have strong attractive interactions between the atoms in the bond. Okay, stronger the attractive interactions, the lower the potential energy. The mantra, right? The stronger the attractive interactions, the lower the potential energy. Stronger bonds means you have strong attractive interactions, meaning lower potential energy. Do we have any questions, concerns, comments about this? All right. One more thing. Okay. Let's do this. All right. I think that should be enough time for this question. I'm going to close it in five, four, three, two, and one. All right. And here are our responses. Okay. Most of us said if the products have stronger bonds than reactants, 
potential energy will be lower in the products compared to the reactants. Okay. On the other hand, if the products have weaker bonds than the reactants, then the products will have a higher potential energy than the reactants. That's it. Okay. So what this means is, let me see. I mean, if I can, uh oh, that's not what I want. So let's say that we have potential energy on the y axis. Okay. We have potential energy in the y axis. And then if we draw the reaction path or reaction progress, let's say reaction path, reaction path or reaction progress, sometimes we refer to this as reaction coordinate as well on the, um, um, on the x-axis, okay? So we always start from the reactants on the left-hand side and end, up, uh, and end up with the products on the right-hand side. Okay, that's going to be the way, I mean, the, where we uh, we build uh, the energy diagrams for reactions. Okay, so in the first case, you told me that products have stronger bonds than the reactants. Therefore, the potential energy will be lower in the uh, products compared to the reactants. Okay, so if we depict that here, so we start with reactants. Reactants have a higher potential energy and the products have a lower potential energy. So you're going to be in a situation like this. Okay, so you see that during this reaction, I forgot my red pen today, so I'm going to steal a pencil. So during this reaction, when you go from reactants to products, you need to decrease the potential energy or decrease the energy. If that is the case, energy has to be released or absorbed. If you have to decrease the energy, the energy has to be released. Okay, so this is releasing energy, energy released. If energy is released, what do we call those reactions? Thank you. Those are called exothermic reactions. Okay. This is the basis of exothermic reactions. Okay. And if you look at the situation two in our question, on top of that question, okay. If we have stronger bonds in the reactants compared to the products, Let's call, the, call this reaction coordinate. It's the same thing. Reaction coordinate, reaction path, reaction progress. They mean the same thing. Okay. So if the reactants have stronger bonds than the products, then the reactants will have a lower potential energy than the products. It's going to be like this. If this is the situation, when you go from reactants to products, energy has to be released or absorbed. Everybody. That was lame. One more time. Thank you. Absorbed. Okay. Energy needs to be absorbed. Energy absorbed. Okay. If energy is absorbed, we call those reactions, anybody? Endothermic reactions. And this is the basis of endothermic reactions. Okay. So the assumption two says during a chemical reaction there's a net energy transfer if your reaction is exothermic energy will be released if then if the reaction is endothermic energy will be absorbed and that is that is what assumption two says okay then any questions concerns so assumption two in our model says during a chemical reaction okay there will be energy transfer okay it's going to be either energy released if it is an exothermic reaction or energy absorbed if it is an uh, endothermic reaction. That's what it says. Okay. If energy is released, you okay, it is usually released as heat. You will feel that, you know, it's going to heat up. I mean, if you're, if you're doing the reaction in a flask or something, that flask is going to heat up. You can feel it in your hand. Okay. If it is an endothermic reaction, it's going to, it's going to cool down. Okay. Because energy is absorbed from your palm into the flask, into the system. If it is endothermic, okay, that's the idea of exo and endothermic. Do we have any questions, concerns coming so far? Anything? Okay. Now, by the way, whether a reaction is exo or endothermic depends on the bond strength, the relative bond strengths of the reactants and products. That is it. And I will test you on that during the exam. You need to have that clearly in your mind. Okay. Whether a reaction is endo or exothermic, depends on with, uh, the bond strength of the reactants and the products, relative bond strength. All right. 
no, let's do. Okay, so, and this is the re this is the reverse of the reaction like the and Annie was talking about. Okay, now the question is, um, and it's question is basically how do we know where we have stronger bonds? How do we predict that? Okay, and I feel I mean I don't know I mean I I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna sound like uh, I don't know uh, I I don't want to say that word but anyway. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a mantra that we can use to do that. All right, to predict whether a reaction is exothermic or endothermic, or actually uh, to predict where we have stronger bonds. Okay, this is the mantra. It's gonna give you gonna be very simple as uh, all of our mantras you have seen goes like this. Okay. Everybody should write this down because it's it's going to be easier this way. Uh, let me see. Okay, I'm going to say A B bonds are stronger than A A bonds. That's it. And this works 93% of the time. <laughs> okay. This works most of the time. Okay. AB bonds are usually stronger than AA bonds. Okay. Can somebody tell me what I mean by this? Anybody? Any what 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 do I mean by this? Okay, I need I need the microphone. Maybe you know, do you have the working microphone with you? Okay. Thank you, Annie. I appreciate. Um, I appreciate you. Go ahead. Like um, H two is a weaker bond than like H two O or something. Sure, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So basically, what it says is, uh, keep the microphone there, Annie. Okay, I'm, I'm going to come back to you. The bonds between different atoms will be stronger than uh, the than the bond between the same atom. That's what it says. Can we imagine why though? Anybody? Does it have to do with polarity? Thank you. It's about the polarity. If we have an AB bond, it is more likely to be a polar bond because there's an electronegativity difference between the two atoms, most likely. Therefore, it's going to be a polar bond. While if we have an AA bond, that means a bond between the same atom, it's going to be a non-polar bond. So what it says is basically the polar bonds are usually stronger than non-polar bonds. That's it. Perfect. Thank you, Annie. Do we have any questions, concerns, comments about that? Okay. So the mantra says, for, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious as well, right? AB bonds or polar bonds are usually stronger than non-polar bonds. That's, that's all it says. Okay. All right. Anyway, so with that, let's do this. Let's, let's start predicting now, okay? To predict, this is to predict to predict bond strength the relative bond strength relative okay and this is the mantra to predict the relative bond strength okay so with that let's do this here we go So before I look at your answers, I'm going to show you my thinking over here, if I may. Okay. So here are my reactants on the left-hand side of the arrow. And here are my products on the right-hand side of the arrow. Okay. In the reactant side, I have bonds between nitrogens and bonds between hydrogens, meaning we have AA bonds. Okay. These are usually weaker. On the other hand, on the product side, I have NH bonds. Okay, what we have here is NH bonds. Okay, or this is what we call AB bonds, okay, which are usually stronger. Okay, stronger bonds means lower potential energy. Stronger means lower potential energy. Let me write that too. Okay, and therefore, my products must have a lower potential energy than the reactants. That's the first thing. Okay, so the potential energy wise, if you want to do that this way, potential energy wise, reactants and products, products have a lower potential energy than the reactants. That's the main thing. Now, 
uh, out of the pick diagrams, I'm, I'm going to eliminate options B and D right away. Can you tell me why? Why can't B and D your answers? Anybody? Aspen, what do you think? Thank you. We always go from reactants to products, not from products to, re products to reactants, okay? I just said productants. Anyway, reactants to products, okay? Um, anyway, so for that reason, reactants must be always on the left-hand side and products must be always on the right-hand side, okay? So uh, there are four options. B and D can never be your energy diagrams, okay? So if you have to select an energy diagram in a multiple choice question where you have four options, Okay, it's actually a 50% chance question, you know, because you can eliminate those two right away because they cannot be a, a, an energy diagram at all because we always start from reactants and end up with products, meaning reactants are always on the left-hand side and products are always on the right-hand side. All right, I'm repeating myself like a broken record. I hear, me, I hear myself. All right, so between A and C, I see the, the products have a lower potential energy in C, therefore, uh, C must be my correct answer. It cannot be my correct answer. Why? In in A, products have a higher potential energy than reactants. Therefore, the correct answer is option C. Do you have any questions, concerns, comments about this? So this is an exothermic reaction because energy is released uh, during this reaction. This is exo. Okay. And answers, I think I have more than 80% now. Actually, 90% now. So I'm going to close this question in five, four, three, two, and one. All right. And here are our responses. It's beautiful. Most of us select op selected option A, and that's the correct answer as well. Annie, did you get this answer? Option A? Yeah. So, yeah, you, you answered your own question now. Yeah, perfect. That's better than me answering that those questions. Okay. So anyway, again, the reason is on the reactant side, I have HO bonds. On the product side, we have HH bonds and OO bonds. It might be a double bond or a bond between double and single bond or uh, between oxygen atoms, but it doesn't matter to us at the moment because what matters is we have a bond between similar atoms on the reactant side. Okay. So we have AA bonds here, which are weaker. And we have AB bonds on the reactant side, which are stronger. Okay. Stronger. Stronger. Lower potential energy. So therefore, we start with lower potential energy reactants and end up with higher potential energy products. Let me eliminate options D, uh, B and D. Um, you know, start with, and uh, the answer with reactants at the lower potential energy is option A, not C. Therefore, that's the correct answer. I wonder if somebody, I mean, anybody selected options uh, B and D. Never of us. All right. <laughs> um, that's that's the second most popular answer, actually. Option D. One more time, okay. I'll repeat myself. For, for I mean, you know, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, okay. We always start from reactants and end up with products. Reactants are always on the left-hand side and products are always on the right-hand side. That's it. For that reason, option B and D can never be your answers. Okay. Any questions, concerns, comments? Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to delete my doodling. And if I balance this equation, I mean, the chemical reaction, I'm going to get two and two over here. Okay. I, I needed to do that because we know in the PEG diagram, we have potential energy. So we already did that. Reactants have a lower potential energy than the products. We did not need to balance that to do that. But when it comes to number of configurations on your whiteboards, where do we have a higher number of configurations on the reactant side or the product side? Can you write the answer on your whiteboards? And then why as well? Where do we have a higher number of configurations? Reactants or products? You have a 50% chance of getting this right without knowing anything. But you know a lot of things now. Yeah, if you go to unit one, one page note, you might be able to find a mantra we use to determine the number of configurations.
All right, please, one more time. On your white boards, I want you to write, okay, the state with higher number of configurations, reactants or products. I'll give you 15 more seconds. Where do we have a higher number of configurations? Reactants or OP products? All right. Can I, I don't say anything. Do you, you have a whiteboard here, miss. Do you have, okay. Where do we have a higher number of configurations? Okay. All right. Can I see your whiteboards, everybody? Thank you. I, I, I like what you wrote there, uh, Carly. Okay. So most of us said it's products. Products, right? I didn't see anything from this whiteboard. Can you check whether they have marker pens, please? Anyway, so why? Why do we have a higher number of configurations in products? Anybody? I've talked to Annie already. I want to talk to somebody else. I'm sorry, and thank you so much, Annie, but I'll, I'll, let me try to talk to somebody. What's your name is one more time? Madeline, go ahead. So if the bonds are weak, it tells me about the potential energy rather than the number of configurations. Okay, so the bond strength is directly related to the potential energy, not the number of configurations. But when it comes to number of configurations, who calls the shots? What, what's your name, Miss, again? Dahlia, what do you think? Okay, that's okay, that's okay. Okay, when it comes to number of configurations, who calls the shots? Carter? Yeah, the gases. Okay, when it comes to number of configurations, gases call the shots. I'm pretty sure we talked about this, you know, in the previous life. Anyway, that's okay. Um, anyway, if, if, if you can write that down in your notebooks, at least now, that would be great, okay? When it comes to number of configurations, gases call the shots, okay? The, 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 the side with more gas molecules will have a higher number of configurations. In this case, products have a higher number of gas molecules. Therefore, products have a higher number of configurations. Number of configurations. Reactants have a higher number of configurations and a lower potential energy. Wow. Okay, like this. Reactants, products. Okay, reactants are in the nice corner. It's going to get a present for Christmas. Meaning it's always favored. It's, it's react. So that means this is, this is never product favored, this reaction. All right. Do we have any questions, concerns, comments, anything? All right. And that's, we will tackle more peg diagram questions in a bit. Um, for that, let's do this. Oops. All right, so this is the first question we did today. But if you want to reverse the answer, this is your chance. I'll give you one more minute. Okay. I think the, the energy diagram wise, you uh, you might want to rethink your answers. All right, I think that should be enough time for this question. I'm going to close it in five, four, Three, two, and one. Right? Energy diagram, not the peg diagram, by the way. Okay, here are your responses. Most of us selected option C, and this time it's 141. This is convincing. More convincing than before, for sure. Okay, can be better. Okay, and that's the correct answer as well. Now, why that is the case, we have AA bonds here on the reactant side. We have AB bonds on the product side. AB bond, because pH bonds are AB bonds, okay? AB bonds are stronger than um, than AA bonds. Therefore, products will have a lower potential energy than the reactants. Okay, so that should be your energy diagram, reaction path. All right, any questions, concerns, comments at the moment? Anything? All right, if that is the case, I'm going to clear my doodling. I might come back to the peg diagram question later because, you know, we did that already. I want to move on to uh, the third assumption. Okay. Now, before I do that, I want to mention one other thing. Okay. Assumptions three, 
four and five are related to each other. Okay, one more time. Assumptions three, four, and five talk uh, talk about the reaction rate or how fast the reactions go. Okay, therefore they are related to each other. Okay, so one more time. Assumption one is during a chemical reaction, mass is conserved. Assumption two, during a chemical reaction, there's a net energy transfer, XO or endo, thermic. Okay, and then assumption three is what you're seeing in the screen. The terms, okay, for a reaction to occur, reactants must collide with each other. That's what assumptions assumption three says. Okay, again, if you if you recall the model we have in our head, we have a box. In that box, we have reactant molecules moving around constantly in random directions. Every now and then, they're going to collide. And these collisions, we talked about this, these collisions lead to rearrangement of the atoms to give us new substances called products. Okay? So in other words, for a, for a reaction to occur, the reactants must collide with each other. Okay? Otherwise, you know, there's no reaction. Okay? Do we have any questions about this? Assumption three, reactants must collide. That's it. Okay. All right. Now, here's how this is important to us. Uh, the, the number of collisions in a given time, okay, uh, is, is, is the rate of the reaction. Okay. So let me, let me write it like this way. Okay. So the rate of the reaction you know what? I think I, I have it here. Okay, the rate of the reaction is directly proportional to the number of collisions in a given time. Okay, more collisions you have in a given time, faster the reaction is. Okay. All right. Do we have any questions, concerns, comments? It's really simple, but very powerful as well. Usually. The most powerful things are really, really simple, like E equals MC squared, right? Really simple, but really powerful at the same time. Just like that, okay? So anyway, so with this assumption, we can explain how the reaction rate is affected by temperature, how the reaction rate is affected by volume, the number of particles, the concentration, the pressure, and so forth. Just with this simple assumption, okay? Here's an example, okay? Let's think about temperature. You know what? I mean, you have to tell me now, okay? If you increase the temperature, what will happen to the reaction rate and why? Go ahead on your on your white boots. Temperature, the reaction rate will go up. Thank you. But why though? Reaction rate goes up. I like it. Reaction rate goes up. Why? Reaction rate goes up. I think more, every, almost everybody wrote, what did you guys write? Reaction, reaction rate goes up or down? Goes up. Why? Anything? All right, think about this. Thank you. Yeah, because there's more collisions now, right? Okay, if you increase the temperature, increasing temperature means you are increasing the kinetic energy for particles. Meaning, particles are moving faster. When they move faster, they're going to collide more. That's why you also slow down when you drive on I-10. Okay, because when you drive fast, I mean, you're more likely to collide. The same reason here, right? Anyway, so high temperatures means... Okay, particles are moving faster. When they move faster, they can they they're going to collide more. More collisions lead to faster reaction rate. Yeah. All right. Do we have any questions, concerns, comments about this? Okay. Now I'm going to give you. I'm going to open a question momentarily on top hat. What I want you to do is, I want you to think about bumper cars. Okay, in a room, okay, on a pen or whatever you want to call it, okay? And then, you know, think of uh, molecules or reactants as bumper cars in a given volume or given given room, okay? If you increase the volume, you are increasing the size of the room. If you're decreasing the volume, you're decreasing the size of the room and so forth, all right? So keeping that in mind, here you go. Use assumption three to predict what is going to happen to reaction rate when you do these thing, these four things, go ahead. And here are our responses. Okay. Now let's go over them one by one. Increasing temperature will increase the reaction rate. Why? 
the cars will be moving faster. When they move faster, they're going to collide more. Especially in, in like, like bumper cars, they're they are moving in random directions, right? Most of the time, because, you know. Anyway, so therefore, there'll be more collisions. More collisions means faster reaction rate. Increasing volume. Most of us said uh, it will decrease the reaction rate. Okay, increasing volume is like increasing the size of the room of the bumper cars, okay? If you have more room for the bumper cars to move around, they're going to collide less. If they collide less, the reaction rate goes down, okay? And increasing concentration of reactants. Increasing concentration of reactants is like increasing the number of bumper cars in the room, okay? If you add more bumper cars to the same room than before, okay, there will be more cars like, you know, I-10 or somewhere like that, okay? If you have more cars, okay, they're going to, they're more likely to collide with each other. Okay. More collisions means faster reaction rate, and that's why the reaction rate goes up when you increase the concentration. Oh, by the way, increasing the concentration is same as increasing the number of reactants in the room or in the in the box. Okay. And lastly, increasing the pressure in the gas phase reaction. Okay. Here's what you need to keep in mind. For a gas phase reaction, increasing pressure is equivalent to increasing concentration. One more time, for a gas phase reaction, increasing pressure is equivalent to increasing concentration, okay? Because the only way to increase the pressure is by adding more particles, adding more reactant molecules there, okay? Adding more particles means you're increasing the concentration. All right, do we have any questions, concerns, comments at the moment, anything? All right, so assumption three, Okay. I can guarantee that you're going to see at least one or two questions from this area. I hope that everybody will get get that question right. right. All right. So I'm going to move on to assumption four, which is related to uh, assumption three. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. So what it says is, for a chemical reaction to occur, not only reactants must collide with each other, they must be orientated properly. One more time, okay? For a reaction to occur, not only reactants must collide with each other, they must be orientated properly. Is orientated a real word? No, it is. Okay, anyway. <laughs> right? All right. So what do I mean by this? For an example, let's think about NO reacting with O3 to produce NO2 and O2. When NO and O3 collide, okay, they can collide like this. Oxygen of NO can collide with oxygen of O3. If that happens, it will not lead to a reaction. This is called an ineffective collision. On the other hand, if nitrogen of NO collides with uh, oxygen of O3, and that will lead to a collision that is called an effective collision. Okay. So a co collision effectiveness or configurational effectiveness is what is meant by this. Okay. So now anyway, this is all assumption forces. They need to be orientated properly. Okay. Uh, when they collide, otherwise they will not lead to a reaction. Those collisions will not lead to a reaction. And that's the idea here. Okay. And do we have any questions about this? Anything? Okay, let's do this. And there are there are there are few ways that we can determine whether a reaction is uh, uh, has a higher configuration effectiveness or not, or collision effectiveness or not. Okay, I'm going to show you by an example here without talking too much about it. Here we go. Now let's think about these two reactions: the forward reaction and the re reverse reaction. Can you tell me which? Reaction is faster based on configuration or collision effect. And when I look at your responses, I'm going to see that you have clicked on both of them. Here we go. Yep, these are our options. It's going to be either forward or reverse. Okay. One of them has a higher configuration effectiveness or higher collision effectiveness. Which one is that? Okay. The correct answer is the forward reaction. So here's how we are going to remember this, right? 
Okay, I'm gonna actually, I mean, if you, if you want to, I mean, you may call it a mantra again. Okay, let's call it M2, mantra two, okay? So the idea is going from, going from, that's a nice ringtone. Lower number of configurations, lower number of configurations to a higher number of configurations. I don't like it. I'm sorry. I have to deal with that. I'm going to rewrite that. I mean, I, I don't like writing too many words. All right, I'm going to say going from lower to higher number of configurations is favored or is faster faster due to configuration effectiveness or collision effectiveness configuration effectiveness that's it okay so the idea is if you have a lower number of configurations to begin with okay chances of they colliding with the proper orientation is greater than if we have a higher number of configurations to begin with, okay? That's why going from lower number of configurations to higher number of configurations is favored or faster due to collision effectiveness. All right, do we have any questions, concerns, comments about this? Okay, now here's the thing. I'm not going to talk more about this here, okay? Because I think this is enough for you to complete uh, the homework questions on configuration effectiveness. I even can make them like, you know, participation only. I'm not going to test you on configuration effectiveness during the exam for, or final exam or any exam for that matter, okay? But I just want to, you know, mention that so that you can, you know, think of the homework questions, okay? That's, that's the only reason I want to mention this. All right, now that's assumption four. And assumption five is, again, related to assumption three. And it reads like this. Here we go. I'm going to let you read one more time. This might be the last assumption we're going to talk about, but anyway. Okay, assumption five. This is what it says. Not only the reactants must collide with the proper orientation, they need to have enough energy for the reaction to occur okay if you just you know lightly collide that will not lead to a reaction you need to collide with enough energy enough enthusiasm all right so if you meet people okay if you do not have enough enthusiasm if you're not enthusiastic about meeting people nothing will happen okay anyway take that advice um you need to have enough energy Okay, that's the idea here. The same thing goes with the particles, the react reactants, okay? Unless they collide with enough energy, okay, nothing's going to happen, all right? They need to have enough energy. And can somebody tell me what this enough energy is called? It, it has a special name. Thank you. That's called the activation energy, okay? That's called the activation energy. Okay, now here's the idea. I'm going to, I think I will go back to my energy diagrams for a second okay the idea is here's an exothermic reaction right okay even though products have a lower potential energy than reactants the reactants do not convert spontaneously to products all the time okay why doesn't that happen because there's an activation energy barrier there's a hump like this between the reactants and the products okay and that is called the activation energy barrier okay so now at the top of the mountain, top of this hump, what we have, what we call the transition state. This is the transition state, okay? The energy gap between the reactants and the products, I'm sorry, reactants and the transition state, okay, is called the activation energy. 
more specifically, this is the activation energy for the forward reaction. Okay. And then we have another activation energy that is for the reverse reaction, just like reactants can become products, products can become reactants as well by colliding with each other. And the activation energy barrier for the reverse reaction is this much. This is the activation energy for the reverse reaction. Okay. And then when it comes to the endothermic reactions, okay, here's the hump between the reactors and the products. You see that the activation energy barrier for the forward reaction is much, much greater. This is the EA forward is greater than the activation energy barrier for the reverse reaction. This is the reverse reaction. Okay. Do we have any questions so far? Anything? Any questions, concerns, comments? Now, here's the important thing, okay? If you have... Now, now he, so, he, 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 here's a nice, nicer diagram over here, okay? Again, activation energy is the energy gap between, for the forward reaction at least, the energy gap between the reactants and the transition state is the activation energy, okay? Now... Now, the idea is if you have a higher activation energy barrier, will the reaction be faster or slower? You know what? Don't answer that question. Don't answer that question. You know what? Let's do this here. Okay. Which reaction do you expect to be faster? Reaction one or two? And okay. Before I look at the answers, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually tell you an analogy here, okay? So a certain president in our country okay, decided that we should build higher walls so that we can slow down the immigration. Does it, does it, does it ring a bell? Okay, so you slow down the immigration by you know, building higher walls. There's no tunneling, by the way. This, this, you know, you're coming over the walls. So just like that, if you have higher activation energy barriers, okay, you're gonna you're gonna have slower reactions. Okay, so high the activation energy barrier, slow the reaction, or smaller the activation energy barrier, faster the reaction is because it's easier for the molecules to cross over. Okay, to the other side. Uh, that's 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 the idea. Anyway, so based on that, let me see. Okay, I think most of us picked up reaction two, and that's the correct answer as well. And again. Why reaction two is the correct answer? Because it has a small activation energy barrier. Okay, small activation, small activation energy barrier faster the reaction is. Okay, so maybe we should write a small note there and just for the completion of our notes. Okay, right. So what it says is, nope, you cannot see my notes. Uh. The smaller, the smaller, the activation energy barrier, or let me say, I'm going to call it E sub A, smaller the E A, the faster, the faster the reaction. Right? So E A is the activation energy of the reaction. All right. Do we have any questions, concerns, comments about this? Anything? Okay. And that is assumption five. Okay. Now with that, let's do one other question. Yeah. Okay. By the way, so there's only one way we can decrease. So we wanna we wanna we wanna make the reactions go faster, right? Okay. How can we decrease the activation energy barrier? Anybody? Any way that we can decrease the activation energy barrier of a reaction? I heard that. What is that? Thank you. We can add a catalyst. Okay. When we add a catalyst, okay, we can decrease. I'm gonna within code and code. Okay. Act, decrease the activation energy barrier by providing an alternate path. Okay. So just to emphasize that. Top at agrees. Okay. 
So when you add the catalyst, it decreases the actuation energy barrier. As a result of that, the reaction goes faster. Okay, so this green curve is with the catalyst. Okay, and this is how we represent that. Any questions, concerns, comments? Okay, this is the only way we can, you know, change the actuation energy barrier. All right, so with that, let's do this. I feel like I want to mention assumption six briefly just to give you a preview of coming attraction. So let's spend one minute on this and then one minute on assumption six and then we're done. Because there are only six assumptions and then covering that will, you know, help you more, help you review, uh, for example, more effectively. Forward reaction is reactants becoming products. Reverse reaction is products becoming reactants. Forward is reactants to products. Reverse is products to reactants. All right, I think that should be enough time for that. Okay, I'm going to close this question in five, four, Three, two, and one. And yep, here are the, the, the most popular answers and those are the correct ones as well. One more time, if you go back to my notes really quickly, okay? So for exothermic reaction, for the forward reaction, you will have a small activation energy barrier. Therefore, the forward reaction is faster compared to the reverse reaction because reverse reaction has a great activation energy barrier. For endothermic reactions, Okay, uh, the reverse reaction has a small activation energy barrier. Therefore, the reverse reaction is faster than the forward reaction. Therefore, exothermic reactions are more favored based on the rate, based on the activation energy okay, compared to endothermic reactions. I just want to mention that. And then briefly, assumption six is next. Okay, assumption six says, okay, not all the reactions go to completion. Okay they achieve what we call an equilibrium, okay? The idea is at equilibrium, let me write at uh, equilibrium, equilibrium, okay? This is the condition, the rate of the forward reaction, let me call this rate sub F, rate of the forward reaction is equal to rate of the reverse reaction rate of the reverse reaction. I'm going to call it rate sub R, okay? The, re okay. the idea is at the equilibrium, reactants are still converted to products and products are still converted to reactants, but the rates are equal. Therefore, it seems like nothing is changing. In actuality, they change all the time at the constant rate, okay? So this is the, the, the condition for that. This is just a preview. I'm just, uh, I just want to mention this so that you can review for uh, example, okay? We'll